So welcome everybody to uh, live stream number two uh, of, on February 5th. I had to look at my calendar there since I'm losing track of the days uh, because there's a lot going on still in California weather. Um, the, uh, the big story now, well, there are two. One is that Northern California is still reeling from the results of yesterday's storm. Uh, particularly the wind aspect of it, which was uh, essentially um, top tier in some coastal portions of Northern California historically. There's, there's a number of indicators. You can go based on wind gusts. You can go based on societal impacts. But this is one of the more memorable extreme wind events along portions of the central and Northern California coast that I can recall. And other folks are saying something similar. It's not the singularly most extreme, but again, no two events are alike, and it did affect some areas that had not been hit as hard during some of the historical events previously, so I think that's part of what the problem is. Uh, and uh, PG&E is now saying this is one of their top three uh, storm events they've had to deal with in their history as a, public, as, as a utility. Uh, so, you know, whether we take that literally or not, I, I don't think it's an unreasonable statement given the, the, the level of damage that we're seeing. And in fact, some of that damage is only now coming to light because power and telecommunications have been down across a wide swath of Northern California. Uh, several hundred thousand power customers still equating to probably around a million people remain without power in Northern California, and some of whom have apparently been told to plan on multi-day restoration time. So. Uh, a lot of places have already been out over 24 hours, and it may be several days yet before the power comes back on in some of the hardest hit areas. It does look like the, the in certain uh, corridors of extreme wind that there were a lot of trees that came down and some even some damage to the power poles uh, and transformer infrastructure itself. So major repairs have to uh, be undertaken. It actually looks like some places that weren't out of power earlier are out of power now, and I'm guessing that's because the utilities are having to turn off power in some locations to safely fix some of the infrastructure because you can't do all of the work with live lines, especially if they're compromised or on the ground or something. So in some cases it may get worse before it gets better. It is getting better overall. There are a lot fewer outages to, uh, this afternoon than there were this morning and there were fewer this morning than last night, but there's still almost a million people without power in, across the different chunks of central and northern California. So that's still quite substantial. Uh, but the bigger story right now in terms of ongoing storm damage, at least Northern California is cleaning up. And unfortunately, it does sound like there were a couple of wind-related fatalities, at least two people killed by falling trees in both instances. So this can be considered a deadly windstorm in Northern California. Uh, hopefully, it's not uh, deadlier than that. Uh, but there is some potential for further harm, especially in Southern California, from flooding, which is what I want to emphasize next. Uh this event in LA specifically has been an utterly historic rain event. Uh, if you're on the west side of LA or in the Santa Monica Mountains, there really hasn't been a heavier rainfall event in recorded history. I think we'd probably have to go all the way back to 1862 in those places, uh, specifically to see 24 to 48 hour precipitation amounts of this magnitude. So UCLA campus is on track to shatter pretty much all of its rainfall records from this event I believe there, I don't I haven't looked at the most recent number, but I uh, let me see actually what one of the, the numbers were as of a couple hours ago. It's been pouring since then, but let me just see uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Chad Thackeray at UCLA, uh, atmospheric scientist there. Uh, looks like uh, this was about two hours ago and he uh, tweeted or whatever it's called now, that uh, over the past 24 hours, UCLA campus has received 11.8 inches, so 300 millimeters, closing in on a third of a meter or a foot of rain, of rainfall. Uh, this That is now three times the average amount for the entire month of February. And at that point, that was the second wettest period for that observing site going back, uh, I believe, in the 90-day, the uh, sorry, the 90-year the record. Uh, on campus there. Uh, and the, the very highest uh, two-day total looks like it was, uh, uh, oh, wow, the, the previous highest total was only 10 inches. So that really breaks 
all records by a considerable margin. That means that as of earlier today, UCLA broke the all-time 48-hour rainfall record by a full two-inch margin, and it's still pouring. Uh, and so uh, the highest, highest daily rainfall on record uh, UCLA uh, previously was looks like just over six inches, and now again we're we're at, we were at seven and a half inches uh, and rising. So just to give a sense, not to focus too much on UCLA campus, but it is interesting that during this event UCLA and the 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 base of the Santa Monica Mountains have been some of the most anomalously wet places in all of California during this event, but most of the LA basin has been similarly uh, hard hit. And the Santa Monica Mountains in particular are, are, are just seeing kind of ridiculous rainfall totals, especially given that in some cases they're higher than, than, than the San Gabriels and the other higher portions of the transverse ranges. That's not typical, and it's one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of landslides and mudslides, including some that have destroyed houses and vehicles uh, in uh, Beverly Hills, Hollywood Hills, uh, Topanga Canyon, and a number of other places. Um, along with that urban and small stream flooding. People are finding springs popping out in parking structures and across roads and streets that no one really knew existed. And they were there, they've been there hydrologically and geologically for, for centuries, but this is one of the first events since we paved over them that has really brought them back to life to this degree in this part of the, the, the state and this part of the city and county in particular. So West and Central LA County have probably been the epicenter of this event so far. Uh, Fortunately, I'm not hearing of any reports of casualties in LA or in Southern California from uh, this flooding, which is good news. Um, there is definitely uh, some growing reports of property damage, especially from some of these mudslides and debris flows, although nothing uh, that I would consider catastrophic. So widespread significant flooding and locally serious and severe flooding but nothing that is completely off the walls insane, at least in terms of impact. So it's interesting that this precipitation event, from a precipitation accumulation perspective, has really shattered records, uh, but it hasn't necessarily shattered uh, the flood impacts records, which is which is pretty, you know, that that's, that's better uh, than it could have been. And I think this may come down again to rainfall rates. This storm started out uh, with pretty high rainfall rates of an inch of an hour or more, but the rate somewhat decreased, certainly this morning and even this afternoon with the resurgence of rain. We weren't seeing really extreme one to two inch per hour rates. So the hills are completely saturated. They're starting to give way. Everything's flooding uh, just because of the sheer volume of water. But the rate at which it was falling has remained just manageable enough to prevent worse outcomes. And I think this is something similar to what we saw during the uh, hurricane uh, tropical storm Hillary event uh, back in August, that that record-breaking summer rainfall, now we have uh, in a six-month period, both record-breaking summer rainfall and record-breaking winter rainfall. So both in season and out of season, record-breaking 24-hour totals. I don't think that's coincidental in Los Angeles and throughout Southern California generally. Uh, but what's notable there too is that some of the worst, worst case flooding outcomes during that event also were averted by the fact that the hourly rainfall rates remained manageable and there was some potential for them to be much higher. LA is not out of the woods yet. There is rain is still falling and there actually is some concern that the rainfall rates could increase if there are any isolated thunderstorms later this evening. So I don't want to speak too soon, uh, but it looks like large swaths of LA County will have experienced genuinely historic and record-breaking rainfall without necessarily seeing the kind of historic flooding that might in some other context be associated with that. Not to diminish the damage that's occurred, and maybe we're going to see more and hear more later, uh, but that is generally what I'm seeing. Um, I know folks were afraid about a repeat of something like happened in Montecito in 2018. So far, fortunately, uh, no indications uh, of anything that extreme. I do think we're lucky that the last fire season was not a severe one in Southern California. It was actually quite mild. There, there was very little burned area and even less area burned at high severity. Had we experienced this rain event in a winter immediately following one of the more extreme recent Southern California wildfire seasons, I think we would be having a very different story and we would have seen numerous catastrophic debris flows. Uh, but we have not, and I think we're benefiting somewhat from the last one to two fire seasons actually being 
pretty quiet in Southern California. So it just goes to show you how much those antecedent conditions do matter. Uh, and so I wanna take a look now uh, at some data and some imagery. I'm gonna start with the easy stuff and, and get into the complicated stuff. So I'm gonna share, I'm gonna start not with radar. Well, actually let's start with radar because it's, it's more straightforward. Um, all right, so here is the most recent view in LA. Uh, and this is from the Los Angeles radar. And lo and behold, finally, at last, there is a break over much of LA and especially here are the Santa Monica Mountains and it has briefly stopped raining. It won't last long, but it's good to see a break. Uh, right now, what we're seeing, here's a little, what I'm a little bit concerned about is that this blob of convection over here, so these are surface-based convective showers a lot of this precipitation over here uh, is is actually coming from more synoptic scale uh, frontal features. And so this precipitation in this area is a little bit less intense than it looks on the radar, but this precipitation is probably a little bit more intense than it looks on the radar. And some of this looks like it's actually moving back towards Santa Barbara and the transverse range is further west. So there could be, some, depending on whether this holds together, there could be some renewed flooding problems uh, in, in the Santa Barbara County uh, coastal area and the transverse ranges in the next hour or so. So that's that's a little bit concerning. We'll see how much it holds together. Uh, that This is actually a region that we thought kind of thought was mostly done except for maybe isolated downpours throughout, but if this, this is one of these slightly less, uh, um, slightly more widespread convective downpours. If this moves over some previously flooded areas, that could be a problem. Uh, but also let's move east because this system is finally moving east of LA County as well. And you can see again in this view that there is a bit of a break right now over LA, although the rain, uh, I should say over West LA, uh, it's still continuing really in the eastern half of Los Angeles, sort of east of downtown. Uh, we still have a moderate to heavy rain in some places, uh, clearly continuing up into the mountains as well. And there's still more uh, offshore ready to come on, although this doesn't look particularly intense right now back there, that's the atmospheric river continuing. But look into Orange County, uh, this might not be the best view. I actually might need to go down to the San Diego radar finally to get a view of this. Um, so the front finally uh, and the associated atmospheric river is about to move into San Diego. So it looks like there might be getting sprinkles or virga down here, rain that's uh, evaporating before reaching the ground. Uh, but it's about to start raining in San Diego and in Orange County. I don't think the flood risk is going to be extreme as extreme in, uh, in, in the far southern uh, part of the state. So really from... Uh, Irvine uh, southward to San Diego. There will be some flood threat in this area and the precipitation intensity will pick up overnight into tomorrow. So there will be a flood threat, there will be some heavy rain, but I don't think we're gonna see 10 inch totals, 12 inch to 15 inch totals like we have up in LA County where the flash flood warnings are still in effect. So there could yet be heavy precipitation and flooding down here, but I'm not as concerned as I am still farther to the north. So we'll see what happens in Orange County. There could be some de significant debris flows in the canyons uh, in that vicinity, uh, the ones that uh, sort of uh, angle out towards the ocean uh, that have upslope flow, but that remains to be seen. I'll keep an eye on it. I did want to go over to the Vandenberg uh, radar in the central coast since it's actually more active than it was earlier. As you can see, that, that unstable air in the cool sector of this low is generating showers and thunderstorms once again. So there's some pretty a pretty hefty line of uh, showers and maybe some embedded thunderstorms with torrential downpours once again, heading up uh, about to make landfall on the central coast from Cambria, Morro Bay down toward uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. So there could be some isolated flooding challenges there. And as I mentioned, this band of, this arc of strengthening showers and isolated thunderstorms is headed back for the Santa Barbara coast, and these are fairly slow moving. If they get hung up over the terrain, there could potentially be some new flooding issues once again uh, in Santa Barbara County this evening. The real question to me, in my mind, is whether we start seeing this kind of activity uh, further to the, to the east over LA County. LA County, the hills are just absolutely saturated. They cannot take any more rain. So even a brief downpour like this could cause almost instantaneous and pretty serious flash flooding and debris flows. So the big wild card remains, uh, if we continue to see moderate, sustained moderate to briefly heavy rain in LA County with more uh, light rain in between, I think we'll uh, get through this event without 
events much more serious than we've already seen. Probably some additional debris flows and mudslides, but probably not any additional extreme, any new extreme flooding. But uh, if we do get see these convective downpours develop further east, and there is some, some of the models are suggesting they will do so further east in the overnight hours and even into tomorrow morning, then although the flood threat will be more isolated and conditional, it would still be considerably elevated. And the this really the hills in LA are as saturated as they've ever been. So uh, the the challenge is going to be: uh, Do we get these in, in more intense convective downpours uh, further to the east once again, which appears possible but isn't guaranteed, or do we not? That's going to be the question about whether or not there's any worsening flooding in LA or whether we've seen the worst of it, but there will be some lingering flooding. And again, as these move north, there could, there could be some uh, localized flood issues again along the central coast. Moving back north, the bulk of the storm has moved on, but they're still in the cool sector, and the Bay Area has continued to see these spokes of uh, heavy, sh heavy downpour, showers and thunderstorms moving through. Most of them at this point are from the South Bay, southward into Monterey County. Uh, you know, Santa Cruz Mountains getting hit pretty hard again. This could result again in localized flooding or mudslides once again. These aren't widespread downpours, but they're pretty intense where you're getting them. The winds, at least, have finally died down. That's the one piece that has gotten a lot better everywhere. Uh, and storm cleanup continues. And up in the northern, Sac up in the central Sacramento Valley, things aren't too crazy, but there are some lines of showers, and it looks like there's a thunderstorm trying to develop over by just west of Grass Valley. So. Nothing too uh, too crazy out there, but I would say really the main action remains from the south uh, southern part of the San Francisco Bay Area southward uh, along the central coast and into Southern California where the atmospheric river remains overhead. And I want to show some additional uh, I want to show some additional uh, imagery, satellite imagery. Uh, there is a note that some new evacuations are underway in Ventura County currently, and I don't know exactly what that is for, if it's an, in anticipation of additional upcoming precipitation, which is possible, although there's not expected to be that much more at this point, or whether uh, there is some specific incident that that's in reference to. So if anybody happens to know, let me know in the chat and I'll take a look at it. Um, what I want to do now is change what I'm sharing and share instead. Um, Yes, I want to share satellite imagery. Or actually, here's a composite rain. Uh, here's a com some composite radar for Southern California. I'll show that briefly. And what you can see, this is a different radar product. Look at how the stratiform precipitation associated with the primary atmospheric river, it's streaming right over Southern California, sort of in this southwest to northeast direction, or almost south to north direction. But look at these showers over here. These are the convective showers that I was talking about. These are anchored in the boundary layer. So in the lower levels of the atmosphere, they have slightly different steering. And so they're moving more slowly and in a slightly different direction than, this, than these other precipitation that are falling from higher cloud echoes. So in some cases, you can see the precipitation falling from the higher level clouds more gently falling into uh, the heavier, more intense precipitation from these lower level cumulus clouds. So you can see movement in these clouds in multiple layers of the atmosphere. In fact, let me see if we can actually visualize that by zooming in a little bit. Uh, and the sun is about to set, uh, or it's setting just to the east, but we still can see this. You can kind of see this a little bit. You have to look a little bit farther west, but if you look in this area, these are those convective cells anchored in the boundary layer that I'm talking about. This marks the edge of the high cloud of the, the synoptic scale upward motion in the atmosphere that's generating along the atmospheric river, these clouds and precipitation. You can see how these clouds down here are moving at different speeds and in a slightly different direction than this. And that's because at different levels of the atmosphere, winds do blow in different directions and at different speeds. So that shouldn't be too surprising, but it's an interesting, sort of fascinating view. Um, and I'm zooming way out. Um, take a look at this. Uh, this is a satellite view that I've never shown in a live stream before. It's California, just San Diego is right up here in the upper right corner of the screen. Look how far south this atmospheric river goes. I don't think that I've ever actually seen one that digs this far south. For reference, the latitude of Hawaii is about here. So Hawaii is well southwest of California, and this atmospheric river is going way south even of that. It's literally off the map, and I'm going to have to zoom out. Uh, I'm going to have to zoom out to, to show you 
just how much farther it's going. Look at that. Again, there's Hawaii. This is coming from way south of Hawaii. And in fact, even this level of zoom isn't quite enough. So I have to go to the global sector. Let's do this one more time. I mean, that's, that's an amazing, amazing view. Look at that pipeline. I wouldn't even call it subtropical moisture at this point. Since this is Hawaii, if the, if the moisture tap is going back all the way down here, that's essentially deep tropical moisture feeding into this. And we are lucky that this didn't align slightly more cohesively with Southern California. If we had an extra 12 to 24 hours, we would be getting a lot of this deep tropical moisture uh, making it all the way into Southern California. Fortunately, it looks like this event is going to taper off right before that happens, but it's an interesting thought experiment for how this storm could have been actually a lot worse and more persistent. Uh, one thing that, that Southern California is still going to have to deal with, though, uh, is all of these convective clouds spinning offshore. So as this, this spin of low pressure, there's not as much moisture associated with it, but the air is very unstable. So scattered showers and thunderstorms are going to spin across the central coast in Southern California tomorrow, even once the atmospheric river plume moves east and south of San Diego. And although the continuous rain will be broken and there will actually be sunny breaks for some storm cleanup, uh, if you get hit by one of these convective cells, it could drop a quick half an inch to an inch in an hour, and that could cause pretty significant localized flooding. So I'd expect that the Weather Service will keep that flash flood watch at least up, just even though these storms will be isolated thunderstorms, normally these popcorn convection clouds wouldn't be a huge problem. In the current context, if you get caught under one of these, you might actually see a flash flood or a debris flow or a mudslide or something like that. So this will continue. The Bay Area northward will be drying out tomorrow. The Central Coast, South, and Southern California will still continue to see some scattered uh, showers and thunderstorms, and they could be heavy at times, even though the unbroken rain will likely have moved on by that point. But as you can see, for now and for the rest of the night, this atmospheric river is going to remain across Southern California before slowly making progress eastward and starting to get San Diego wetter. It is kind of remarkable that UCLA has seen over a foot of rain today, and San Diego has seen, I believe, a trace. That is quite the gradient, and it will change soon, but it hasn't changed yet. All right, uh, let's see now. Um, is there anything else I want to show? Oh, yes, I can show. Uh, let me show you the California Power Outages website. As you can see, the numbers have been going down. The hardest hit counties lingering at this point, Mendocino County is still in pretty bad shape, as is Sonoma, Napa, Yuba, Nevada, Placer counties. Uh, the Central Coast is looking better than it was. The South Bay is looking better than it was. But honestly, there's still tens of thousands of outages in pretty much all of these counties. So uh, this is all uh, going to continue to be uh, take a while for it to completely clean up. And then let me take a look at the most recent modeling uh, one more time here uh, on screen, since I actually haven't looked at the most recent update myself. So you'll be seeing it live uh, once again uh, for me, uh, with me on screen. Let's see. Um, all right, so this is the most recent model cycle. Um, let's, let's do simulated radar, because it kind of emulates what, uh, what you might expect to see. Okay, so you can kind of see this atmospheric river plume is still stalled over Southern California. Precipitation intensities are a bit lower, but here's what I'm a little bit concerned about. Look at these uh, down here in the Southern California Bight. Uh, this is uh, sort of in the middle of the night, well, not even the middle of the night. This is late evening uh, into uh, 8 to 10 p.m. and going toward midnight local time. Are right, These showers and heavier thunderstorms uh, right along the central coast. This is back west of L.A. County again. This could result in an increased flood risk once again later this evening, if those hold together as suggested. And this model suggests that even though this main frontal band and the atmospheric river will move eastward into San Diego, giving LA County a break, look at these sort of these showers and thunderstorms that move in behind it. Uh, these could pose those higher hourly rain rates, and look at what happens by around 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. There's some showers and thunderstorms near LA County, and I wouldn't take this map too literally. This model is not going to represent the exact position of individual thunderstorms correctly this far out. Uh, but the challenge is that even though the, the main rain band will be gone by tomorrow, we're still going to be left with quite active shower and thunderstorm activity, and that's precisely the kind of intense hourly rainfall rates that could cause problems given how saturated things are. So as I mentioned, these showers and thunderstorms will taper off through the evening across Northern California, but they're going to remain going across Southern California, just where we don't need it uh, for uh, the rest of the night. In fact, let me uh, 
go back to the 18 Zulu run just to see this goes out a little bit farther in the future. When does this finally move on? So here we are at 8 at 9 a.m. tomorrow, showers and thunderstorms lingering. They start to clear out across Los Angeles by late afternoon, and then there's still showers and thunderstorms over San Diego until early evening tomorrow, which is some brief lingering showers maybe over L.A. after that. Uh, although some, some showers and thunderstorms continue down in San Diego even into Wednesday morning. And here's the other thing I wanted to point out. Uh, there will be uh, another weaker system moving through probably uh, on Wednesday, later on Wednesday. And look at this. Uh, this. This high resolution model suggests this will be a pretty robust band of showers and maybe some thunderstorms moving through the Bay Area. This would be, uh, let's see, this would be 2 7. So that'll be Wednesday around 7, 7 p.m. So uh, this, uh, I don't see any extreme wind or anything with, like that with this or any really high, but these are briefly intense rainfall. And if that swings into Southern California, let's let's look at one of the models that has a slightly longer uh, time horizon to it. Let's see what this thinks. Uh, again, this is that uh, Tuesday. Uh, things finally calm down by uh, late, late uh, tomorrow afternoon into Wednesday, but then this next system comes down, might be associated with some isolated convective activity not a huge storm, but it might actually bring yet another burst of rain, brief uh, heavy downpours to Southern California. So depending on what this looks like in a couple days, it could be a very localized flood threat, but nothing like what we're seeing now. Uh, by the way, these, these additional systems might bring a little bit of snow uh, to the Sierra, but these are kind of coast huggers again. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on that uh, bringing uh, too much additional snowpack accumulation. Uh, and let's just see sort of what the total precipitation is looking like moving forward from this point, uh, just for the rest of the current storm. Uh, we pull that out on the her, and this is sort of what we're looking at. So San Diego still stands to see a couple of inches of rain potentially. Uh, and then again, here's that convection near the Ventura LA County border. That's a little bit concerning because that could be another quick two to three inches. Uh, LA County in general, it looks like things are starting to wind down, but there could be up to an additional inch at lower elevations and two inches at higher elevations. So boy, oh boy, uh, that's a lot, a lot of water. Okay, um, I'm going to stop sharing this screen. You're going to see me again. And let me take a look at what people are actually talking about. Uh, I can't always see that unless I take a look. Um, all right, I'm gonna go through the questions and I think I can get through a lot of them since there aren't too, too many right now. Uh, thank you folks for the kind words. Yes, I was on the Weather Channel this morning and I think they've been reusing that footage uh, multiple times today. So uh, catch me there, catch me on the BBC, catch me in the New York Times, catch me in a lot of places um, depending. And I know that the local outlets are probably going to be grabbing uh, the uh, some of the clips from these YouTube sessions instead of doing direct interviews. Um, a question from uh, MG, could you share the name of the radar website uh, I'm using? Uh, there's actually two, one of which is, it's actually an app, it's called Radar Scope, and it's excellent. It's the one I primarily use. It's the only weather app I have on the phone, and I promise they haven't compensated me to advertise for them. Uh, although I wouldn't say no to a sponsorship. But anyway, it's a good app, uh, and I personally use it for you know day to day there's a little bit of a learning curve you do have to know how to interpret weather radar and you kind of have to have some intuitive sense of which radar site uh, is most appropriate but of course there's geolocation and stuff like that so i do i do recommend it it's much better heads over heels uh it leaps and bounds better than than most of the free stuff you can find online unfortunately and the national weather service uh, their internal weather radar viewing module within their website is not ideal. Now, the historical reasons for that are not because the Weather Service is not capable of making uh, a good weather app or improving their website, but they've been stymied uh, by Congress and essentially prohibited from quote-unquote competing with the private sector. Uh, I philosophically don't think that's a reasonable argument or a good justification for preventing a public agency from improving public knowledge, but anyway, uh, given all of this, Radar Scope is a pretty affordable annual subscription. So that's what I use personally. 
Yeah, Bob Miller in Oceanside mentions that it's been steady drizzle for 18 hours. It has added up to 1.8 inches. I might call that a little more than drizzle, but I get your point. But now the heavier part of the AR is moving over, which is consistent with the radar that we were seeing. Um, a question from Matt Reynolds. You know, I answer, I'll answer this because I actually get this question a lot. Do you get compensated for your national TV appearances normally? The answer is exactly 0% of the time. Generally, it's considered unethical for journalists to pay their sources, and I'm not a paid contributor for any network or any outlet. So the answer is all of that is entirely uncompensated, 100% uh, of the time. And that's not just for me. That's generally going to be the case for people who don't actually have a job uh, as, a, as a pundit. Um, I just play one on TV, I guess, for free. Uh, let's see. Carolyn mentions that family in Redwood City just got their powers on a few hours ago. Uh, it looks like pg and &E crews have been making progress, certainly, uh, but there are still a lot of areas out of power right now. Uh, Foggy Sunset asks uh, about what's going on near downtown LA near the unreinforced Glendale Narrow section of the LA River. Rain is still falling and what's the flood situation? It looks like it's manageable. As I mentioned, if this storm were producing sustained rain rates of over an inch per hour in the water, watershed above the LA River still, then we'd be seeing bigger problems, but it is not. There have been enough breaks in the rain and the rainfall rates have been moderate to heavy, sustained, but not extreme. At really at any point. So as long as we can maintain that, I, I don't think the LA River is going to have any major problems. Glad to see the folks saw the PBS spot today. Go public TV. Uh, Warren mentions in the past six days that, that, that he's measured uh, 15, uh, over 15 inches of rain in San Anselmo with no real flooding. Um, and, you know, as, as Warren points out, that is less unusual in certain parts of Ring County, uh, orographically favored areas on and, and below on the windward side of Mount Tamalpais can get phenomenally heavy rainfall. In fact, some places can see, you know, five or 10 inches of rain from a storm where San Francisco or the East Bay might see, you know, half an inch or something. Um, that does happen pretty regularly, and it's all down to the orographics. And of course, any given area, you know, the flood risk is a product of the hydrogeography as well as the precipitation, as well as the built environment. As you mentioned, there's not nearly as much paved surface in, in Marin County as there is, say, in central LA. Uh, but also, you know, the geology is used to it. I mean, the, the, the watersheds, the river channels, the creek corridors, they're all carved by the precipitation events that have occurred historically and prehistorically. And so they are essentially, you know, you can kind of get a sense of how much precipitation a region gets, either on average or at least in the extremes, based on just looking at the shape of a river channel or the shape of a, of a, of a creek even, or a canyon. You know, these are usually, there are geologically significant floods that carve these in any given place. And so you get a sense of what the extremes that are possible as well as the ordinary events, uh, just by looking at the geology and the what you know looking at the actual geography from a hydrogeological perspective so yes you know the flood risk is you know 10 inches of rain in houston texas is not the same as 10 inches of rain in la is not the same as 10 inches of rain in seattle and you might be surprised which of those places can handle at least well i actually think the biggest problem would probably be 10 inches of rain in seattle seattle does not get extremely high one day uh, precipitation totals almost ever. In fact, I think that LA's record one day total is probably higher than Seattle's uh, because although it rains frequently in Seattle, it doesn't always rain that much all at once. So Seattle is wetter on average, but the precipitation climatology of Southern California and of Houston is actually more, both more extreme than Seattle. Interesting trivia there. Yeah, Diane Lopez, Lopez mentions that there was a death in Santa Cruz County. I think that was unfortunately a wind related. I think that may have been a tree. I think that's the same thing that happened in the Central Valley where the other death that I'm aware of was. Both of these were deaths caused by falling trees. So there have been a number of fatalities in recent California winter storms in the past few years from falling trees. In fact, 
in many parts of the country, it's the case that the flooding is deadlier than the winds. I, 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 don't, I don't know how the math pencils out long term in California. It's possibly because we haven't seen a lot of deadly flooding recently, but we have seen a lot of major windstorms. And unfortunately, you know, there's a certain amount of uh, tree attenuation that happens even in a healthy forest or healthy grove. But in recent years, we've seen a lot of severe drought. We've seen wildfire. We've seen bark beetle infestations. And so these things have stressed trees. There's dead and weakened trees. I think a lot of them are, are more susceptible to failure during these extreme wind events than they might have been in a cooler, uh, more stable climate period. So that, that is an interesting question about whether the, the, the hazard from these weakened trees is greater. One practical lesson is to pay attention to the trees near where you happen to be, especially if you own property. And if there are trees that look like they're not doing very well or they're high hazard trees, Unfortunately, you know, you may need to think about whether that they need to be taken down. Um, and I know that there are plenty of uh, arborists uh, and uh, chainsaw experts uh, in the Weather West comment section who'd be able to help you out with that, irrespective of, of where you are in California. Uh, but there is something to be said for, for being proactive about that, because sometimes, sometimes you don't know, you know, sometimes if the wind is extreme enough, even very healthy trees, uh, eucalyptus, uh, mature eucalyptus trees are, are often known as widow makers because they're extremely heavy and extremely susceptible to catastrophic failure in windstorms. Uh, so when they fall, they fall hard and then they tend to crush things. Um, and they aren't always the best at dealing with the massive wind loads because of course they're not trees that are native to this part of the world. They're imports from the southern hemisphere. They do grow very well here given the climate, but um, sometimes it's a dangerous mismatch. Uh, mismatch. Uh, they're known as the, the windstorm widowmakers during winter storms and then also as the exploding uh, matchsticks during uh, fire season. So eucalyptus trees, you know, I grew up uh, right at the base of a, grove, a big grove of them, so I, I do think they're kind of amazing plants. Um, but also in the California context, they pose some big problems. And actually, on a somewhat tangential note, this is part of why these fires down in Chile near Valparaiso recently, which I mentioned in a previous call, were so deadly. Uh, immediately upwind of this populated area were plantations of trees, tree farms that included eucalyptus, planted at very high density. And unfortunately, those went up in a major crown fire upwind. So that's a bit tangential, but uh, do be careful. Do be mindful of your trees during events like this. They really can be dangerous. Folks mentioning it's starting to rain again in Santa Barbara. You see that on the radar. Yeah, Philip remarks, I think in response to the deep tropical uh, moisture tap for the storm that's even farther south than Hawaii, suggesting coconut express rather than pineapple express. That's probably a good idea. Maybe somebody suggested it before, but that, that's a nice way of differentiating it. I don't think we'll see too many of these. Uh, and actually, I'd be interested for somebody to scientifically do a back trajectory of uh, the actual water vapor molecules in this atmospheric river to see if they're truly being transported from the tropics or whether it just looks like they are. That is one thing. Sometimes looks can be a little bit deceiving. Uh, Diane, unfortunately, reporting that there may be additional deaths in, in Santa Barbara, uh, again, from falling trees. So that would actually make for a death toll from the storm that is higher than in many recent winter storms in California, so far all from the wind damage component rather than the floods. Uh, Jack Hodges asked, do the models show a retrograde of the atmospheric river back westward over LA County for Tuesday? Uh, the retrograde that was predicted has essentially happened. It's what's happening now. So that's why it's still raining. By tomorrow, it really is going to be east of LA. As I mentioned, though, based on the data that I showed, the problem is going to be that the showers and isolated thunderstorms that follow could still produce heavy rain rates. So although the atmospheric river will have moved on by tomorrow morning uh, towards San Diego and then eastward, these heavy, locally heavy showers afterward could cause higher rain rates, which would actually be more capable of causing flooding than the sustained moderate rain that LA is seeing at the moment. Uh, 
Uh, let's see. Peter Gordon reports four and a half inches of rain in Foothill Ranch since 5.30 Sunday night. Continues, but no heavy downpours at the moment. However, the next comment is regarding heavy rain, fairly heavy rain falling in the foothills above Montecito right now, which is sort of the convection that I was talking about. That could cause some problems potentially. Robert says, uh, we've gotten 8 to 12. Uh, I'm guessing that's inches, and uh, given the storm, I'm guessing it's inches of rainfall rather than inches of snow in the mountains, which uh, 8 to 12 inch snowfall in the mountains would be not that impressive, although this year some places would be happy to see it, but 8 to 12 inches of rain anywhere in California is a notable event. Don't know quite where that is, though. Uh, several folks asking about Tulare Lake. This was not the kind of event that's going to add a lot of water to the San Joaquin Basin or the Tulare Basin. So I don't think, I mean, there was some heavy rain locally in it, but I don't think this is an event that's necessarily going to substantially uh, fill up Tulare Lake. Now, that remains to be seen whether we see events more like that uh, later this winter. That could still happen. Uh, but uh, that is not what we're seeing from this event, you know, and there's a couple things I wanted to close with. I'll come back to that in a moment. All right. Well, there were two things I wanted to cover and I actually, uh, right. I was frantically right before the session trying to post a thread to Twitter, and I'm going to share the link here. I know not all of you are on Twitter, and I frankly, I don't know. Uh, it's probably, most of you, it's no surprise that I'm not a fan of the direction that the company formerly known as Twitter uh, has gone in recent days, but I am still there because it is still, I think, the best venue for sharing this kind of information, although I am also elsewhere. You can find me on other social media sites. I am sharing a link to Twitter. Uh, the original twitter.com URL still works, by the way. Uh, hint, hint, if you convert the x.com uh, address to the equivalent twitter.com address, it may still be publicly accessible without an account. A little known secret. Uh, but the this thread is in response to a number of things. It's highlighting some of our recent research, first of all, which I think is relevant in this context, pointing to the fact that we have looked, you know, I and others in who, who have collaborated with have done research specifically looking at extreme atmospheric rivers in a warming climate. Not just atmospheric rivers, but specifically the most extreme atmospheric rivers in California in a warming climate. And what we find is, of course, that they are going to get more intense in a warming climate, but that they may increase at a faster than expected rate. So the integrated vapor transport, for example, during extreme ARs may increase faster than you'd expect from a clausius clapeyron thermodynamic scaling. What that really means in practice is that instead of that nice 7% uh, per degree centigrade of warming that we hear about, sometimes it might be more like 10 to 14% per degree centigrade of warming. And all of a sudden, that's a pretty big number because we've already warmed globally 1.3 to 1.4 degrees centigrade and more in California. So all of a sudden, that's not a small number at all. We also found that the hourly rainfall intensities associated with extreme atmospheric rivers would become significantly more intense than the total cumulative precipitation increases. So, so in other words, the very most intense hours or the very most intense storms get more intense faster than the overall cumulative precipitation from those storms themselves. So that's another interesting feature. So that it likely had a very heavy downpours, which we've seen any number of this year, go up particularly fast in a warming climate. And there's some more details that I think folks will be interested uh, to read either the papers, if you go to that thread, or also there are Weather West blog posts. When we publish these, these papers in the thread, uh, I wrote up nice long Weather West posts on them that remain archived, available freely for everybody to read, as do the papers themselves if you want to dig into the actual scientific publications. Uh, but check out the links in that thread. But the other thing I wanted to mention, and this keeps popping up, folks claiming that this is the arc storm, that California is experiencing the arc storm right now. And this is an extension of a bunch of misinformation that was circulating in recent days and weeks. 
this is far from an arc storm level event. And I want to emphasize that for a few reasons. One, uh, the most important one is that I don't want folks to be too falsely reassured that they weathered this event uh, reasonably well and that therefore they're prepared for the kinds of extreme storm sequences we think are highly plausible and have increasing likelihood in a warming climate. Because this, as significant and historic as it has been, this has not been a statewide catastrophe. And anybody who uses that kind of language I think is exaggerating. There have been deaths and that is really sad. There's been significant societal disruption. I think the power outages and the road flooding probably affected more people even if it didn't necessarily uh, cause a, a crisis in their lives, it certainly is causing major disruption. The folks who are still out of power, the folks who can't get, to, can't get home, can't get to work because the roads are flooded. But this was not a statewide catastrophe in the same way that a true sequence of extreme atmospheric river storms would be. And we find in our research that the likelihood of seeing that has probably doubled already in a warming climate quietly in the background, and that it will likely double again on our path towards two or more degrees Celsius of global warming. And that's pretty concerning because the impacts of an event like that would be far worse than what we're seeing from this event. We're lucky that this is not part of a very long, intense storm sequence. But imagine if the sequence of events we just experienced with a severe windstorm in Northern California and now a major flood and rain event in Southern California repeated itself several times over in a row and then was preceded by unusually wet conditions, and then also still followed beyond those events by additional unusually wet conditions. That's what the arc storm scenario would look like. So we would be saying, oh my God, LA just got 10 to 12 inches of rain today. And then a few days later, we'd be saying, oh my God, LA is getting another 10 to 12 inches of rain again today. And then there'd be another one. So. The impacts of that, as you can imagine, would be pretty disastrous and would be far different from seeing a big one-off event like this one. And I'm glad that the impacts haven't been worse with this event from a flood perspective in Southern California. Although I think, again, we were saved somewhat by the relatively reduced hourly rainfall rates. Had there been more convective instability in the system up to this point, I think we would have been seeing a, a significantly wider disaster. And that is also something, by the way, that we see in our ArcStorm 2.0 related research that the likelihood of seeing intense hourly rainfall rates and more convective instability during these storms likely is going to increase in a warming climate, which is why it's interesting that this year we've seen a lot of coastal instability, a lot of coastal thunderstorms, a lot of record-breaking near coastal downpours, and record warm ocean surface temperatures in some places. Again. I don't think that's a coincidence. So all of this is just to say, you know, there's a lot of news stories about what's going on in California right now, and I'm still astonished by how few of them mention climate change. And no, we don't know exactly how much climate change contributed to this particular extreme downpour as it continues to rain heavily on the rooftop uh, rain gauge at the UCLA weather station, exceeding all previous daily and two day rainfall records uh, to our understanding. But the reality is, we know that in a warming climate, that extreme precipitation events are getting more intense. That's just the way it is. It's a pretty basic function of atmospheric thermodynamics and that expanding atmospheric sponge I keep talking about. Baseline assumption is that we see about 7% per degree centigrade or about 3 to 4% per degree Fahrenheit more extreme precipitation for every degree of warming. And we've already seen a considerable amount of warming. And the way that atmospheric thermodynamics works, you, can't, you cannot run them forever. So although there are not yet any studies that I am aware of showing large and robust increases in extreme precipitation in California yet, or large and robust increases in the intensity of atmospheric rivers over California yet, part of that is just because we haven't done those studies with the last few years of data. The last few years of data points, I think, might kick us up into statistical significance. But my point is, whether or not we fall on one side of that statistical significance line or other in terms of detectability of this trend, this increasing trend in extreme precipitation, we're clearly on that path. And we're seeing a lot of events that are awfully suspicious, that are exactly like the ones that we're talking about. And all of this research that's screaming about how the likelihood of seeing these sorts of events is increasing, 
and then we're seeing all of these events all around us. So I think that, and if anybody wants to write this paper with me, I don't have a lot of time right now to lead something, but if anybody scientifically wants to collaborate on a very short paper, just looking observationally at has the last few years of data, and I'd want to use 2023-2024 data, so I'll have to wait for this year's statistics to come in and be finalized first, but I'm pretty sure at this point that if somebody crunched the numbers again using up-to-date data looking at extreme precipitation, either hourly rates or 24-hour rates, or extreme atmospheric river IVT, that we'd see a detectable signal now at this point in California or broadly along the West Coast. And there's been hints of it for years, but nothing super definitive, even though we, we, we long know that it's going to come. It's kind of like some of these other predictions about worsening wildfires and worsening droughts in California that were, until the past decade, mainly predictions, uh, but now have become clear, unambiguous, observed realities. Uh, I think we're sort of on the cusp of that with these extreme precipitation events. If it's not now, it'll happen, and it'll happen in the next five or 10 years, probably. But I think my point is, sometimes scientists say that there's a lack of evidence. What they really mean is that no one has crunched the numbers recently, and that the p-value isn't quite what you would want it to be. And I think that that is really kind of contextually misleading, given if we were just p-hacking, as it's called, and sort of manipulating the statistics to sort of try and prove something, that we want to be true, that's different from looking at whether something that we understand on a really basic level, a basic thermodynamics level, about how the atmosphere works and how atmospheric thermodynamics work, uh, whether or not we've started to see the events that we know are essentially inevitable in the long run is a different question than asking completely stabbing in the dark and sort of looking around for uh, things unknown. So I guess my point is, if you have a physical hypothesis about something and you think that something is probably happening, it's a bit of a different approach than just uh, randomly throwing out hypotheses and throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. So anyway, with that tangent, uh, I do want to take one more look at the comments here. Please do feel free to check out the thread uh, that I posted above and the links from it if you're at all interested in what I was just mentioning. But I do want to take one more look at the comments here and then do one more radar tour before departing for the evening. Uh, so let's see what's going on again. Look at the questions. Uh, Bob uh, asks uh, for me to go on threads. I am on threads. I'm not as active on threads because, quite frankly, the number of people there and the level of engagement is still way, way lower than a lot of other websites. But I do have a presence there, and if you have an account there, you can follow me at weather.west. I also now have an Instagram account, believe it or not, because I had to sign up for one in order to get on threads. I do not post uh, climate change content there, uh, at least not directly. In fact, I don't really post scientific content there at all. I, I decided that I, I'm, on, I'm so available on so many other means that I'm only going to post weather and, and cloud-related photographs that I've taken on Instagram. So I'm actually using Instagram as it's intended to be used. So if you want to follow me for cloud pictures, uh, Instagram is the place. Threads, I, uh, I, I repeat a subset of what I already post on Twitter. I'm also on Blue Sky, slightly more active than Threads. It's a little bit livelier there. Uh, I'm not super thrilled about primarily still using X slash Twitter as my primary social media uh, text-based platform. That is the way that it is at the moment still. But of course, all of you are here on YouTube. Uh, and have found me here, uh, and honestly, this format is working pretty well. Now, I've some of the some of these live streams during this current event have had over a thousand people live, and tens of thousands of people have watched it after the fact. Uh, that's a rapidly rising level of engagement. Now, the question for me is, I will say, my office hours during extreme weather events are much better attended than the ones where I'm talking science uh, in a more uh, temporally uh, asynchronous context. So the challenge will be, can we get to a thousand folks on one of the future live streams uh, when I'm not talking about an ongoing weather event, but instead talking uh, about potential future weather events or climate change or wildfires or other topics in earth and climate science. So uh, maybe that's a challenge. Um, I probably won't have one of those sessions for a while since I've done a gazillion of these and probably will do at least one or two more before the event is all said and done. 
So I'm a little bit burned out. Uh, but the next time I do have those uh, scheduled sessions with uh, more topical uh, sessions, or also ask me anything sessions, I will let folks know. Let's try and get as large an audience for those as possible. Some folks asking about whether uh, out like toward February 20th. Right now, that's still 15 days away. We don't know. I don't see any super big signals of really alarming precipitation. I, I do think we're going to dry out towards mid-February, which everyone needs it. That's great. It'd be nice if we got a little more snow in the Sierra right now, but given the context of everything, drying out is probably a good thing. Um, there is potential for a wet pattern to return again later this month, and a lot of places are already going to be sitting above their seasonal averages by the end of this week. So that could be a problem later, but let's cross that bridge and we come to it. There's nothing overly alarming right now, and it does look like everyone's going to get at least several dry days later this week and probably more than that. So that's that's I'm not super concerned about that sequencing right now. All right, let's see. Uh, folks asking about the origin, by the way, of the of the term arc storm. Uh, it is well, it is it is a term from before my time. I didn't pick the name. It is an acronym, by the way. It's a, a one of those tortured academic acronyms that you sometimes hear. It's A R K S T O R M. So A R stands for atmospheric river. So far, so good. K stands for a thousand. Uh, and storm, of course, I guess speaks for itself. Atmospheric river, one thousand storm. What does the thousand stand for? Uh, it stands for a, a minor scientific paleoclimate error from 15 or 20 years ago, because at a time it was thought that an extremely severe storm sequence comparable to what happened in 1862 during the Great Flood of 1862 occurred roughly every thousand years. Since then, it's become quite clear that that event actually, events of that magnitude probably happened every one to 200 years, so were about 10 times more common than was thought at the time. Uh, so Atmospheric River 100 doesn't sound so cool. Uh, so essentially, it's a tortured acronym. That's where the, that's where the, the, the name comes from originally. Uh, this was coined back in 2010. That was before my time in, in the arc storm domain. So I wasn't involved with the original coining, although I have been involved with the revamped arc storm 2.0 stuff over the past couple of years. Uh, it is a tongue-in-cheek reference. The folks saying, you know, questioning whether it's got the 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 Noah's flood reference. I think that that was explicitly the original tongue-in-cheek uh, acronym creation. So that the tortured acronym is created to uh, read that way. It's probably not what I would have chosen, uh, but I think it works. It certainly gets people talking. Uh, I actually personally am more miffed by the K part, the thousand, because that's a that's a uh, a scientific uh, course correction. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that the Arkstrom scenarios have really gotten people thinking in a way that they weren't before about California flood risk. I still wish that more folks at the state level and the regional and, and local levels would be taking these sorts of risks more seriously. I, I, I don't think we should pat ourselves on the back too much for getting through this event without a catastrophe because this wasn't the real test as remarkable as it has been locally, particularly um, on the rooftop at UCLA, apparently. Uh, but that's the, that's the history there and a little bit of inside baseball. No offense to, to Dale Cox if he's on, if he's on this call. He, he, he was on uh, one of the earlier, uh, uh, a couple of the earlier live streams. Um, it's all good work. And I hope you're enjoying your retirement. Uh, Let's see what else we've got today. Yeah, for perspective, last year is a better analog for a lesser version of Arcstorm, actually, because last season we did see an onslaught of, of many atmospheric river storms ranging from weak to strong in a row, just one after the other after the other. But none of them were extreme, which makes it different from the Arcstorm scenario. Yeah, that, that helped us out. and they were spaced out just enough to prevent really worse flooding. And they, 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 it was more of a three week sequence than a four or five week sequence. And 
fourthly, I guess, I've already listed a bunch of things, they were pretty cold. Last winter storms were cold and snow levels were quite low, meaning that a lot of that precipitation actually didn't melt right away and didn't enter rivers, lakes, and streams right away and contribute to runoff. We had that long, significant snowmelt season, nervous San Joaquin to Larry Basin snowmelt season that ultimately also wasn't catastrophic because it was a relatively gradual melt. Imagine if last year's storms had been 10 to 20% more intense, as they will be with global warming, or if they had been two to five degrees Fahrenheit warmer, as they will be with global warming, and then all of a sudden we get pretty close to an actual arc storm-like scenario. Uh, so last year in some ways was a better actual analog for that than this year was, even though it still came well short of even the lesser of the two arc storm scenarios in, in our arc storm 2.0 world. All right, uh, last thing I want to do, uh, I know some folks, there's some attenuation on the stream. I'm going to do one more radar tour uh, to see what's going on. Um, that's a trailing view of the satellite, by the way. I need to switch over to the other application here. Uh, but before I go, I do want folks to see, and I'm curious what's going on in radar scope. So here is Southern California again. Here is the LA radar again. And as I mentioned, it, it is actually filling back in. There is more precipitation once again filling in. It's light to moderate right now uh, across, over, over the LA basin, but there's another new wave of, of, of heavier stuff. Looks like it's coming up, up through Long Beach. There's probably some terrible commute down in South LA right now. There's more rain filling in once again, uh, transverse ranges and uh, Santa Monica Mountains. And like what's going on in the central uh, Ventura into Santa Barbara. This is what we were sort of concerned about earlier. And this arc of heavy downpours, these are convective downpours, and they are moving back over land, Oxnard, Ventura, and into Santa Barbara. So they're really, the flood threat is not over. Uh, it will continue uh, in this area uh, overnight. Let's check out the Vandenberg uh, Air Force uh, radar and see if this gives a clearer picture. Uh, and, uh, all right, I may have uh, frozen the app from overuse. All right, I'm gonna quick close it reopen it, reshare it, since that worked last time. Uh, let me uh, do this again. All right, uh, back up on screen. All right, yes, this worked. Uh, we're back at LA. Let's go back to Vandenberg since it actually looks a little spicy. So actually this Vandenberg, the view from Vandenberg, there's a lot going on again, uh, honestly. Uh, so, uh, Again, these heavy showers and maybe even isolated thunderstorms over southern Santa Barbara County. Uh, this is some hefty stuff once again. There could be some localized renewed flooding concerns from Oxnard into Santa Barbara into Solvang. Uh, and then again, uh, up the coast a little bit, some more uh, pretty intense showers and thunderstorms, uh, coastal San Luis Obispo County. So potentially some more flooding up there. I'll go up to San Francisco Again, these rounds of showers, they're, they're, they're localized, but they're quite intense. Another round up by Livermore coming out of the Santa Cruz Mountains. Uh, and then I want to go down toward the Santa Ana Mountains, see what's going on. Again, heavier rain moving back into South LA by Long Beach. This is still the core of the atmospheric river. And then if we go south, uh, even further south into San Diego, has the rain arrived yet? It looks like the rain is, as, as we speak, just arriving uh, down by the international border. So it has just arrived in San Diego. It should be raining there now. Doesn't look like it's too intense yet, but the more intense rain is still sort of back off here out of radar sight. So yeah, you probably won't see it yet. Uh, so one more, one more view uh, from LA. Um, I think my app is frozen again. So uh, I'm gonna take that opportunity to end the radar tour and uh, You'll see me back on screen again briefly. Well, I think uh, at this point, this is probably uh, all I got to say for now. Uh, if something really dramatic happens, if for some reason some really intense thunderstorms or convection pop up over LA or Santa Barbara counties and cause much worse flash flooding, 
later this evening. It's a low probability. I'd call it under 20%, but that's not zero. Uh, then I might pop back in, but if that doesn't happen, this is probably the last you'll see me today. I'll probably schedule something for tomorrow, time TBD. Uh, but uh, the flood threat is is probably on average diminishing tonight across Southern California, which is the good news, but it remains conditionally high. If you can get under a heavy downpour, there could be big problems. Everything is super, super saturated. And also the flood threat in Orange and San Diego counties will probably peak overnight into the morning. And there will still be some isolated thunderstorm downpours tomorrow, which won't be widespread, but could cause isolated flood problems in Southern California into tomorrow, uh, all the way through tomorrow into tomorrow evening from LA into San Diego. So I'll check back in again then. Uh, all right, everybody. Thanks again. And uh, see you next time.